Professor Tribe, I had two experiences with that Merrick Garland interview today. I watched it before the Washington Post reporting came out tonight, and then I watched it after the Washington Post reports that Donald Trump is under criminal investigation by the Justice Department. And when you watch it after the Washington Post reporting, the language Merrick Garland chooses seems even stronger. I agree. It seems to me very clear that when Lester Holt asked Merrick Garland, aren't you worried about tearing the country apart? All of these possible collateral consequences of criminally prosecuting a former president. There are so many ways that Merrick Garland could have answered. He could have said, well, we have to weigh everything. We take everything into account. It is the job of the attorney general to weigh all these factors. But I'm glad he didn't. He very carefully said, almost, almost said, well, that's above my pay grade. That's not my job. I'm the chief prosecutor. I follow the evidence where it leads. And when he said that, of course, he knew he had to know. And he had to know when he was scheduling this interview that people who had testified before the grand jury had spoken to people at the Washington Post. He had to know didn't know exactly what Carol Lennig's story would say, but he had to know that the fact that the president is being investigated, the former president is being investigated as a potential target of a criminal prosecution would become public. And in light of that, when he chose to say, that's not my business, I'm not the healer in chief, it's not my job, it might be the president's job when he's asked perhaps to grant a pardon the way Ford did to Nixon. It's someone else's jurisdiction to worry about those things. But when I heard him say that in the first place, I thought, that's a very good sign. It suggests that he is not usurping a role that doesn't belong to him. And then when I saw the remarkable reporting in the Washington Post, it all came together. It became clear that the Department of Justice, all the way back before the public hearings began, had been carefully probing several different converging strands of a combined plan to overturn the election. The strand that involved pressure on Pence, hence asking probing questions of Mark Short and of of Greg Jacobs, and the strand that involved phony electoral certificates, all of it coming together. And it seems to me that when Merrick Garland said what he did, he was coming as close as would have been appropriate to say, yes, we are investigating Donald Trump because we have to make sure that whoever is responsible for attempting to overturn the election is held criminally accountable. He couldn't quite say that, but interpreting somebody that I've known for 50 years, that's what I was hearing him say. And then reading the Washington Post, I thought, yep, that was it. So we are now on a completely different phase. We now know that a former president who quite obviously did all he could uh, to overturn the election is not going to get away without being carefully probed by this department. Of course, there are a lot of choices that remain for the attorney general, because there are so many different crimes that this fellow committed, defrauding the United States, um, attempting to overthrow the election, fomenting a violent insurrection, probably seditious conspiracy. Which of them should be charged? In what order? All of those decisions, sequential decisions, what evidence, that isn't necessarily going to be decided overnight. But those are decisions of a typical prosecutorial kind. They are not momentous decisions about whether the attorney general is going to make history. And I think he's performing his job admirably. And those of us, including me, who were impatient, I think have now been told, see, I was really ahead of the game all along.
Carol, this is really astonishing reporting tonight. Uh, and, and I have to ask you, uh, it's often said that the Washington Post has been publishing the first draft of history for a very long time now. Did you feel you were holding history in your hands as you were turning in this story tonight? Well, I have to say we were extremely careful and cautious as we approached uh, hitting the publish button because we know how this story will be read. Um, we know how closely it will be read, as all of our stories are. We don't want any error. But also in this instance, Lawrence, I think you do intuit something important, and that is while there's been a lot of swirl of investigative activity by the Department of Justice, this is the first time that we've known for certain that they are eyeing the, the former president of the United States. And it's no small thing because, you know, lots of presidents, former and current, have been investigated. But no former president has been prosecuted by the Department of Justice ever, despite substantive evidence of crimes on the part of some. And when we write this piece, we are we're saying something significant about our our knowledge, but we're also saying something significant about the the precedent that is being set by the Department of Justice here today. So the Washington Post uh, published this subpoena yesterday uh, showing that what they're interested in, among other things, is any communication uh, to, from, or about Donald Trump, agents of Donald Trump. I mean, the, anything involving Donald Trump, uh, if you've communicated about it, they want to know that. That subpoena now, framed in your article tonight, along with the information uh, about Mark Short, these two grand jury witnesses who were just there, uh, and others, apparently, that uh, you're aware of, uh, who have been asked many questions about Donald Trump. How, how would you describe the level of focus uh, for on Donald Trump in some of the grand jury testimony? You know, here is a moment where I'd like to say uh, kudos to my colleagues on this byline, along with me, Devlin Barrett, who covers the Department of Justice, Josh Dossie, who covers nearly everything, Spencer Chu, who covers the U.S. Attorney's Office, all of them with me, um, plied into this territory for many, many days to try to unearth what, what these details. And what the team learned was that so much of particularly Mark Short's conversation with the grand jury was dominated by what did Trump say? Then what did Trump do? What did Trump tell his lawyers? Then what was Trump's reaction to that? And that, um, that description over and over again of 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 the grand jury prosecutor who's not asking for a fishing expedition right a grand jury is when a prosecutor is asking questions they know they need the answer to in preparation for trial in preparation for prosecution and so the significance of this goes way way up when a prosecutor said so tell me what the former president said about that that dominant feature of the grand jury also took us aback, that, that questioning. If this had been an FBI agent and a 302 in which an agent asked somebody a bunch of questions about Donald Trump, it would be just slightly less dramatic because the agent's trying to learn things as they go. In this case, we're in prep for prosecution. The uh, how many grand juries are at work now? Uh, there was a, there's been a grand jury in place that has been uh, operating, uh, for example, on the actual insurrectionists and people actually attacking the Capitol. Grand jury investigation involving uh, targets like that. Is this a separate grand jury involving this higher level of target? You could be my editor, Lawrence. So that answer I don't have, and I'm sad to say it. The My sense is that this would be distinct grand juries, that the, the rioting um, to trespass or to domestic extremist charges are being handled in one, and that this work starts anew this year with a fresher jury. But to be fair, I don't know for certain. So we have all sitting out here uh, had the impression, some of us more confidently than others, I, I haven't been very sure about this, that 
The January 6th committee is running far ahead of the Justice Department uh, in terms of investigating this arena. You have now jumbled that impression because you are now showing us the Justice Department running ahead of the January 6th committee on some of this. Well, yes and no. I think it's right to say that um, the January 6th committee put intense pressure on the Department of Justice and its probe. But it's also accurate and, and news to me, frankly, when I learned it, that the phone records that the Department of Justice sought and ultimately obtained in late April was before these you know, high pressure hearings. Again, there's one more wrinkle, as I'm sure you know, Lawrence, because you've been working on this yourself for so long. The committee, before they began the hearings, the congressional committee interviewed so many witnesses. So just based on the witnesses, the transcripts, the, the evidentiary material they've taken on board, they're loads and loads ahead of the Department of Justice on that front. And actually, some of that testimony under oath I'm led to believe the Department of Justice will be making good use of. In other words, it will be purposeful for them as an investigative tool as they proceed. In other words, they don't have to re-interview a ton of people unless they want to bring people in for the grand jury to make sure the grand jury hears the full story. But that those transcripts are really gold for the Department of Justice. And the the January 6th committee is so light years ahead of them in terms of gathering that roadmap. Carol, as you were gathering information about what was included in the grand jury testimony, what piece of it struck you the most as as focusing most clearly on Donald Trump? Is there is there an Oval Office moment that is being that the grand jury is studying most closely? I think it would be skewing, um, you know, the audience's impression uh, about what we know and don't know to focus on two grand jury appearances, that of two very senior Pence aides that we personally know about, that we know the details of. It would be unfair to say from that we can conclude that the Department of Justice is focused overwhelmingly on how Trump pressured Pence, bullied Pence, tried to get Eastman to agree to push an effort for fake electors, because we don't know about all the other willing grand jury witnesses who come in and said, hey, if you subpoena me, I'll be happy to tell you what happened. We don't know everything yet. And uh, I would just say stay tuned. Hard to believe, but It got even crazier today at the Secret Service. The chairs of two House committees are calling for the replacement of the inspector general who has been investigating the Secret Service. In a letter today to the inspector general, Joseph Kafari, Penny Thompson, in his capacity as chair of the Homeland Security Committee, and Carol Maloney, chair of the Committee on Oversight and Reform, described, quote, Inspector General Kafari's failure to promptly notify Congress of crucial information while conducting an investigation of the Secret Service's preparation for and response to the January 6, 2021 insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. Inspector General Kufari failed to provide adequate or timely notice that the Secret Service had refused four months to comply with the Inspector General requests for information related to the January 6th attack. And the Secret Service has replied to my question, did Secret Service Director James Murray delete his January 6th texts? In an email reply to us, the Secret Service spokesperson said, quote, the only text messages on Director Murray's phone on January 5th and 6th were notifications from his alarm company at his residence. By policy, Secret Service employees are not to conduct official government business via text for information security purposes, as well as government record retention. And joining us now is Jim Helminski, who served as 
Deputy Assistant Director of the United States Secret Service until 2015. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I want to begin with this issue involving the Inspector General, another turn in that road where uh, suddenly uh, the House of Representatives certainly has lost confidence in this Inspector General and wants him replaced. Uh, What's your reaction to that? Well, that was an article by Carol Lennox, who obviously is the master of all things Secret Service, whether good or bad. Uh, my opinion on that situation is, it in uh, when you read the article, it talks about that the that the Inspector General knew about other messages uh, as early as December of twenty twenty one that were deleted, and that was the cause of the or the expected removal of the uh, Inspector General to another more uh, neutral inspector general. Now, if you look at that, uh, this sort of brings uh, Tony Ornato into a more question here, because it goes back to, you have to start asking the question, what about the Oval Office meeting on December 18th, where the stop to steal actually began? And you see the text messages between uh, Cassidy Hutchison and Tony Ornato. Uh, maybe that's where this investigation starts beginning. I, I want to go to the, the issue of text message policy. So we learned in our response uh, about our question to the director that as apparently at the Secret Service now, it is against Secret Service policy to use uh, any text messaging uh, in your official Secret Service capacity on any Secret Service subject. Now, uh, you were at the Secret Service when text messaging was actually invented, when it came into our lives. Uh, did the Secret Service develop that rule while you were there? Well, I don't know what their exact policy is now. But text, mes- text messaging was a casual form of communications uh, across a broad spectrum of uh, agencies. Um, it, you know, I read your media inquiry, and on one hand, it says that we have a policy, that strict policy of no text mes- messaging. But on the other hand, they're asked, they've identified 24 people. 10 of which that they said have deleted, erased messages. So what is it? Do you have a policy or you don't have a policy? And so uh, what would you suggest uh, we should expect as this investigation goes forward on the text messages? What should we be looking for at the Secret Service? Well, the Secret Service, the first thing that they should be doing is that their Secret Service legal department should be discussing with these 24 people what Did you tax? Now, did you tax on government phones? Did you uh, tax on private phones? Either way, it becomes part of the federal record. And, you know, any way you look at this, Lawrence, uh, it's not a good look for the Secret Service. Justice has been obstructed, whether it's been through a malicious intent or ineptitude by not having a strict policy for texting. 